Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Guardians of the Cyberspace. My name is Manny Balzilai, and I will be your host for today. Um, in this podcast, we bring the most interesting cyber leaders of the world, and you cannot claim to have a podcast where you bring the most interesting cyber leaders of the world without having the one and only Karen Alazari. So I'm very excited to have Karen with us today. She's a good friend of mine. She's a world-renowned cyber expert. Karen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Manny, for this wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to join you on this fantastic podcast. And this should be a really fun and interesting conversation as we are the guardians of cyberspace. I really like that title. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm super excited to have you with us. Kevin, you are you're a speaker, you're an author, a security expert, a hacker, a consultant, a community leader. You're so many things. How do you define yourself? How do you describe yourself? I think the number one thing I like to be known for is the friendly hacker. So friendly when hacker. I grew up, yes, exactly, the friendly hacker. When I grew up, when I first learned about hackers, I didn't quite know the distinction between bad guys and cyber criminals and other types of hackers. Today, there are so many friendly hackers out there, hackers that are helping us, help, hackers that are part of uh, this initiative, if you will, of being guardians of cyberspace, whether they are doing it at the university or they are doing it on their own in their private time. And what I like to consider myself is not just as the friendly hacker, but also as an unofficial tour guide into this world of hackers and friendly hackers. And that's what I really try to accomplish with my writing and with my communities and with my talks is really showing people everything that we can learn from hackers and teaching the world that hackers don't have to be just bad guys and cyber criminals. They can also be friendly hackers, good girls and friendly hackers alike. And that's really my passion. That's really what I believe defines me. So if if by any chance you're one of those rare people who haven't got the chance to see Karen Elazari's uh, talk on TED, um, she gave a TED talk in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the title of which is? Hackers, the Internet's Immune System. If you Thank haven't got the chance to watch it, you're in for a treat. You should definitely watch it. It is one of the most successful TED Talks, I think, out there, um, definitely in cyber security. Karen, Thank you, Manny. Uh, you know, it's been true. almost a decade since the talk. Uh, I feel like it's time to, you know, put some updates out there in the world, <laughs> a decade. And when I gave that talk, the approaches and the vision that a lot of people had about hackers were different. I'm proud to have taken my part, my small part in the conversation and the global ideas about how hackers can be part of society. And that's changed over the decade. It's changed so significantly. The concept of bug bounty programs that I, I mentioned in that talk, back in that day, a decade ago, it was rare, it was unique. It was something only a few Silicon Valley companies were experimenting with. Now, I believe 20% of the Fortune 500 companies out there in the world all have a vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty program where they can actively collaborate with friendly hackers. So the landscape has changed. And of course, I would be honored if people choose to spend 16 minutes of their day and watch my TED Talk. I am very proud of the messages I share there. And I also think there are new messages to, to speak of today because the role of hackers in our society is one that's continuously evolving. It's not uh, like the same it used to be when you and I started in this business, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Things are changing all the time. In fact, uh, one of my favorite sayings these days is the only constant is change. And uh, what I love about hackers is the adaptability, the capacity for change. I think that's one of the key things that people can learn from, that cyber defenders can learn from hackers. And we see this all the time when we look at what bad guys are doing as well. But we'll have time to, to go into that later. Yeah, so I think this is a very interesting point, and we can double click on that for a second. Um, the, you gave this talk in 2014, a decade ago. It's amazing that it is a decade ago. And it was super successful. And I want to assume, I think it's safe to assume that it changed some people's perspective on the, the, 
place of hackers in the community. And many people maybe started addressing hackers in a different way. And your personal journey was also very interesting after this talk. I assume since this talk was really, really successful. Um, and maybe you can share with us some of the things that happened after this talk that relates to your uh, notion that the positions of hackers in the society have changed. Who talked to you about that? What kind of decisions people consulted with you before they made? How do you feel? And maybe you can share some of your insights about how the position of hackers in the in the society have changed after, like, from since a decade ago. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, I am very grateful. I'm honored that I had this opportunity, that I was approached by a producer at TED to speak at the international TED event. It was uh, it was at first it was overwhelming and where I did the talk at the actual TED conference, Bill Gates was there, Larry and Sergey, the founders of Google were there. Uh, there were a lot of Hollywood actors and all kinds of digital and technology celebrities. I was easily the most anonymous person there in more than one way. After that, certainly my life has changed, but because the talk is popular, people refer to it and a lot of the organizations that I never thought would consider a hacker's point of view reached out of me, reached out to me to understand how hackers can help them. It was very surprising to get contact requests from not just from hackers all over the world, but from uh, companies that are 300 year old companies, luxury clothing or car manufacturers different types of organizations that in the past you would never imagine a company that deals in maybe producing cognac or a company that deals in luxury vehicles to think about how hackers can be part of their conversation. But they decided that they want to do that. More than that, I was really, really fortunate to receive that kind of attention so that I can use that attention to shed light on what other hackers around the world are doing. And in the past decade, I've had a chance to connect with hacker communities in South Africa, in Western Canada, in Tokyo, in Australia, uh, all over Europe, and of course, the United States, in Mexico. So really, there are hackers everywhere. And more and more of these hackers are now taking their place on the world stage. They are much more active. And in the way, they're also bolder in speaking their mind and showing maybe their real identity or maybe it's their hacker identity. I have that dual role as having my hacker identity, but also being very publicly known for what I speak about. As such, I've found that hackers that wish to remain in the shadows reach out to me and then I help them have conversations with very big, very traditionally minded organizations that perhaps wouldn't have that conversation in the past. So this interesting. is- Can you can you maybe share a story of one of those cases? It sounds very interesting. Sure, so um, I'm not gonna mention the name of the company, but it's a very well-known company, a uh, brand name, a American brand that also serves um, Israelis as well as Americans. And during the COVID pandemic, because of various difficulties with the pandemic, they had to let go a very big percentage of their workforce, including their technology and their security workforse. And at the same time, uh, one hacker called Ashutosh from, from India reached out to me and he was, he was able to find a vulnerability, a bug in their public facing uh, internet, in their commercial website. And that particular vulnerability could have led to very significant impact. And he was really trying to get somebody at that company to listen to him. But because that company was undergoing so much difficulties and because their manpower was reduced to maybe 10% of their regular, their regular capacity, they really weren't able to understand what he was showing them. And they weren't able to understand the potential, the impact of what that vulnerability might lead to. So he was almost desperate and he reached out to me. Now, his alternative would have been maybe reach out to a journalist, make it into a big media scandal, or maybe even take advantage of that vulnerability and create an actual cyber incident. Instead, he reached out to me and I was able to reach the chief security officer of that organization. Uh, and she said to me, you know, Karen, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. I am understaffed. I don't have people to deal with this. I'm going to deal with it directly myself. 
So I'm very proud to have been able to mediate that kind of conversation between a CISO of a, you know, a Fortune 500 American brand and this unknown hacker from India. Uh, and but and that's just one example. I have hackers from all over the world reach out to me all the time. And I think some of those hackers might not even realize I am Israeli, as I do get uh, messages from hackers also in places like Pakistan, Iran, uh, other nations of the world, ones where Israelis maybe are not that popular. And yet these hackers reach out to me. So there's also an element of the hacker identity, which is international. And that's another thing I really saw happening in the past decade. Um, one of the things I've been lucky to do, and many you you participated and helped me make that vision a reality, is bring to Israel the concept of security B-sides, which is a hacker community conference. And it's a really great model because it's a framework for how any community of hackers can organize their own event. It started in the US, but now as of this year, there have been more than 800 of these B-sides events all over the world, in every continent you can imagine, even in Iceland. Uh, Australia now has some of the biggest B-sides in the world. So it's incredible that we are able to connect Israel and our local community with B-sides Tel Aviv to this global platform. And through that global platform, I see that there are now proudly hackers organizing around the world to share their knowledge, to share their idea, and you know what? Some of the biggest companies in the world want to hire people at these events because that's exactly the next talent. That's exactly that, that next generation that they need to hire. In fact, uh, I want to thank Tel Aviv University for hosting Besides Tel Aviv each summer. And last summer, we even had the Israeli security agency trying to hire hackers at our event. So this is another sign of how times are changing. Uh, in my first or one of the first hacker conferences I have ever been to, which was 20 years ago in the year 2004, everybody in it was in downtown Tel Aviv and everybody came just with their handle or their nickname and cops or security agency people were not really welcome and hackers were not really open to have any conversation with them, any collaboration with them. This is really changed, and I'm so happy to see that change because I think there's a role in our world as guardians of cyberspace. There's a role for the law enforcement agencies and the national security agencies, but there is also a place and a role for those individual community hackers. And I'm really, really happy that I can contribute in some part to bringing those kinds of hackers together. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds fascinating, and I love the fact that you have hackers from all over the world approaching you, even from countries countries like uh, Pakistan and Indonesia, probably in those places. Yeah. I would like to believe that they know that you're uh, Israeli and they approach you nevertheless, but maybe I'm too optimistic in that sense. I think it was uh, Yuval Noah Harari who said that the internet is the humanity's first attempt to create a group which includes everyone mm -hmm. and not like to differentiate ourselves from, from other people. I would like to believe that, but Let's see. Let's see where we, we the can world be is hopeful. going. We can, yeah, be we can be hopeful. And, it, it, you know, speaking about the Internet, it bears uh, remembering and repeating that even right now in 2024, I think only maybe a third of the world's population is connected to the Internet. I don't have the data, maybe a third or a half. There, there are 10 billion people on this planet and growing. And we still haven't reached 100% capacity for the internet. And we're already reaching to other uh, parts of the world or parts of space. Starlink uh, recently did a test for some of their communications. So if uh, listeners are, are unaware of Starlink, it's one of the initiatives, uh, one of the Elon Musk companies. It's one of the initiatives to create a network of satellites that's going to enable us to have not just a global communication network, but potentially also keep communications going or an internet, if you will, uh, to rockets and spaceships. I think uh, this is one of the things we'll see in the next couple, couple of years. In fact, many, can we talk about this? Because I'm a huge science fiction fan. Uh, Absolutely. Up, up there behind me is a, my, one of my favorite spaceship a model of the Rocinante from the Expanse science fiction show. And it's a show that takes place in the 24th century. So a couple hundred years into our future. 
And in that world, humanity has already expanded to the moon, to Mars, and even to uh, asteroid belts and other planets in our solar system. And it's remarkable to me, every time I watch the show, or I read the books, where they have seamless communication set up throughout that expanse. And they still have cybersecurity problems. They have deep fake videos. They have uh, identity theft or uh, where ships take on the identity of another ship. They change their transponder code to look like maybe they're another ship. So I think the types of cybersecurity problems we're dealing with right now, they're gonna follow humanity into the stars. And it's a really interesting new era to explore space security and space cybersecurity, especially if you consider the amount of satellites and uh, commercial spacecraft that humanity is currently working on. Uh, it's really one of the next areas of exploration, and I'm curious to see what's possible. Yeah, I, I totally agree. As humanity becomes more dependent on technology, it's uh, it's also become more vulnerable and we will see more attacks. So if we're already touching that, that would be very interesting to hear your take on uh, the future of cybersecurity, emerging threats, emerging trends. What do you see as the next big problems that we will need to face as humanity? And then I will ask you about the solutions, but maybe let's try, we'll start with the problems first. So one of the key things to remember, and I talked about this in the beginning, is how adaptable hackers are. Criminals right now are in a golden age, a renaissance of malicious innovation. So cyber criminal groups are really having a very successful couple of years, extremely successful couple of years. It started with the COVID pandemic, which opened a lot of new opportunities for bad guys, but it's really uh, accelerated since then. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about ransomware gangs that can demand ransoms of $70 million that have gone after some of the biggest organizations in the world. Just recently, Lockbit, which is perhaps the most successful ransomware gang, went after ICBC. ICBC is the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. It is the world's largest lender of money, $20 billion in assets. So it's the largest bank in the world in terms of how much money they have, how much money they, they lend. When that bank gets attacked with a ransomware campaign and their systems are locked out and encrypted, that has an impact on the global economy. Uh, mm. Another thing we saw quite recently is an attack. Uh, basically, you could call it like an identity an attack, a social media attack on the Twitter profile of the Securities and Exchange Committee, which is the organization that oversees and regulates the American stock exchanges. And the bad guys, whoever they were, who took over that account, used it to advertise for a Bitcoin um, or maybe another cryptocurrency, either a Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency campaign. So these types of attacks that criminals now have, they're innovative and we can talk about the technology that they use and what makes them innovative. But what I think is really key to remember is their global impact. So it's not just one small company gets impacted. When the port of Nagoya in Japan is impacted with ransomware attack. That means that 50% of the cars exported by Toyota and Mazda don't get out of the, of the port in time. That means people don't get their cars in time. So uh, these types of attacks have global impact. We saw this two years ago with the uh, attack on the colonial pipeline infrastructure in the United States. Interestingly, it wasn't even an attack on, an, on the infrastructure. The systems that were affected were mostly the payment systems, but the company decided to shut down their entire operation just to protect the organization from that ransomware attack. And the result of that was a state of emergency in the East, Eastern United States and people standing in line waiting to get their uh, gas for their car. So what are the biggest problems? I think one, criminals are incredibly innovative, and that is a problem because uh, defenders and most organizations are still thinking about cybersecurity in how it used to be, maybe two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, and that's a mismatch. You know, there's this uh, saying, never bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> so if bad guys are now using innovative technology like generative AI, and they can create phishing campaigns a hundred times or 10 times faster than they previously could, 
And we're not using AI or we're not using new techniques and new paradigms in our defense. We are the people with the knife in the gunfight and we will always be outmatched. So this is the problem. Criminals are very innovative. Technology is changing very fast and defenders are not as quick to respond and adapt and take advantage of new technologies. And that's always been the case, but now that gap is opening up a lot more fast. You know, the bad guys are really moving ahead into more global targets and more innovative campaigns. Another thing, which um, maybe is the biggest thing, and I know I said the other things were key, but this is this is this is really big. And this I think is this really is a, the biggest one. Yeah, and I think this is something that a lot of people will resonate with, regardless of technology, regardless of how you get your news or how you conduct your banking or how you communicate with your friends. One of the biggest things that has been attacked in the last couple of years is our trust, our ability to trust, trust a newscast, trust uh, anything on social media, even trust a video or a voice. And that thing, our ability to trust things, to establish trust, especially in digital mediums, but not just in digital mediums. This is really something that, this is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. Because, um, you know, just to reference the current situation in Israel, in the last couple of months when, when the war began, there were quite a lot of citizens in Israel that downloaded a fake malicious app because they thought it was the legitimate app to get rocket alerts and to know when to go to the shelter. So. This kind of threat really, really keeps me up at night because it's not just, uh, you know, leading people to make wrong decisions. It's something that bad guys can capitalize on in a major, dangerous, catastrophic way. Um, with that uh, taking over a social media account uh, attack I mentioned, we're getting there. We're seeing bad guys doing it. But... Yeah. We are currently at an age where there are certain players on the world stage, on the geopolitical stage, who are really thriving in that kind of chaotic environment and whose goal, whose discipline is to create distrust and to create confusion and to really bring that fog of war everywhere. We're seeing this in Ukraine. We're seeing this with the war that we are experiencing right now. Um, this year, 2024, it's going to be the biggest year ever in historic record for democratic elections. There's going to be about 2 billion people going to elections, whether it's in the United States, in Taiwan, in Europe, around the world. There are so many elections that just coincided in 2024. Who knows? Maybe also in Israel. And that's what scares me. It's a key, it's a keystone year for democracy. And bad guys, criminals and other types of bad guys, strate strategic bad guys, if you will, they have a lot of tools at their disposal to saw distrust, to bring more chaos and more confusion. Yep. And that is really the big one. So you see what I meant when I said yeah. this is really the big one? It's a huge one. <laughs> no, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I think that um, the... The two things that you've mentioned, the first one is AI and the second one is the trust crisis. Um, I absolutely agree on that. I heard you give talks about that. I gave talks about that. Those are very important topics. Um, do you think, um, I want to touch those two things for a second. Um, obviously, hackers already leverage artificial intelligence, uh, generative AI to create phishing attacks, to create fake personas, to do all of those things. And they use other things to find vulnerabilities, to create um, different uh, variants of uh, malware. Um, but we also see a huge amount of uh, startup companies leverage AI technologies to build the new security tools. Do you think that in the short term slash long term, AI will do more good to security or more bad to security? Wow, <laughs> it's a big question, and it's hard to predict that. You know, uh, it's uh, it's hard uh, it's hard to be a prophet of what's going to happen with AI. Ten years ago, I worked, uh, or actually twelve years ago, I worked at some place called Singularity University, which was set up and founded by Dr. Ray Kurzweil, who is considered by many the father or the godfather of modern AI. 
He's also uh, the creator of Kurzweil synthesizers, which you might know many, yeah, uh, as well as other technologies like OCR, optical character recognition. And he also attempted to put out his predictions for the age of the machines. And he's got three or four books about that. And yet it is so hard to predict what's happening because the rate of change is faster than ever. We're no longer in that era where we had the Moore law exponentially advancing the capacity of process processing power. We're now in a different era. Now, with regards to AI, I want to specifically say bad guys are using generative AI for phishing, for business email compromise, uh, for malware authorship. So actually to write and create malware and to even create malware that can have some autonomous elements to them, some polymorphism. So the malware will change every time it runs. Uh, so the malware is more evasive. So they are already really capitalizing on this. There are a lot of security companies that say they use different elements of AI in their product. I have not seen a security company say that they specifically use generative AI, which is what the last year has been all about, tools like GPT and others. And many, maybe you can illuminate me on that if you know any companies that use generative AI and large language models. Uh, but we do see other types of AI at play in cybersecurity products. And that's been the case for the last couple of years, whether it's uh, different, uh, different forms of machine learning and deep learning, I think that it's crucial we continue on that path of developing security technologies using everything that we can. Otherwise, again, it's a knife in a gunfight. It's unmatched. So if bad guys are using generative AI, we should come up with ways to maybe match that or at least to be able to identify when a piece of text or an image or a video was created by generative AI. So that's one area where I see a lot of promise, using technology to verify whether something was authentically generated by a human or by a generative AI machine. Generally, I like to say I'm a techno optimist that I believe that the advancements that we see with technology are on the big picture, better for more people. Um, and I like to believe that. If we look at the numbers and it's hard to look at it, especially in the situation we are currently experiencing in Israel, especially if you consider the difficulties that people around the world are facing in Ukraine, in other parts of the world. But if you zoom out and you look at the big picture, humanity is experiencing an age of prosperity, unlike anything that, that it has experienced before in terms of uh, access to medical technology, in terms of our ability to predict how illness might take place in terms of our ability to use AI to come up with new medications and new treatment options. That's, it's really unprecedented. So I yep. really like to try and focus on those things. It's difficult, especially in our business. It can be depressing seeing all of the cyber attacks and all the innovation done by bad guys all the time. But I try to take hope in that and look at how technology and the internet, at least right now in the big picture, it has improved and bettered humanity uh, at large. I hope that remains that way. It could go, <laughs> it could also go badly. It could go very badly. Uh, but I, I like to believe that most people are better off nowadays than they were before the internet and technologies like generative AI became a part of our life. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I think that those are some of the issues that we will have to deal with and I hope um, I know about various entrepreneurs who are starting companies in those in those like areas where they try to solve those kind of problems. So I hope you will see startups and then major companies um, try or maybe even successfully uh, able to build solutions in this field. We don't have a lot of time. I want to touch two two topics in a very quick way. Um, and then I will go to uh, a rapid session where I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask you quickly. But the two topics that I wanted to touch is, um, which is uh, obviously this is a topic which is very, very important to you. Um, and it's also very important for me, which is uh, women in tech and specifically women in cybersecurity. Karen, you're on mute just to make sure you know that. Um, um, I think the cybersecurity world is uh, losing a lot of... Uh, a lot of smart people because for stupid reasons, 
uh, girls don't study cybersecurity. And I want to hear your take about that and how we can push more women into this domain. So first, let's, let's address the problem. Whether we do or do not have enough diversity in the cybersecurity workforce. I want to start with the good news. In the last couple of years, situation has improved dramatically. My yeah. first hacker events or my first jobs in this industry, I never had a woman boss. I never saw other women at conferences. When I was dealing with cybersecurity in the Israeli army, I never had any female peers or women that I was working with, except for maybe one or two here and there over the course of a long career, even in my reserve service. I haven't seen a lot of women. That's absolutely changed. And right now, there are women in a lot of key positions in our industry, including in leadership roles, which means they are role models for other women coming into the business. So there are women, chief information security officers and big brands, big international companies, American companies, European companies, Israeli companies. There are women teaching at universities. There are cybersecurity authors like me. There are women like Tara Wheeler, whom I um, actually co-authored the Women in Tech book uh, nine years ago. She's now a fellow on the Council of Foreign Relations. She's a fellow at Harvard. She has a PhD from Oxford. And she's really become a role model for a lot of other women. So our situation has changed. 20 years ago, if I wanted to look up to a role model in our industry, I would have very few women I could look up to. That's not the case. I can tell you right now, at least 10 or 20 women that I know that are keynote speakers, that they are popular podcast speakers, that they have books out, that they help people on social media, they have millions of followers. There's even TikTok cybersecurity influencers. So that situation has changed. Now, when it comes to getting more women, young women, whether high school girls or women after their military service or students, to getting them to choose a career in cybersecurity, in that entry level, that's where we do have a lot of difficulties. And the difficulties come from two sides. One is that companies don't really know how to create an entry level position. A lot of companies will want somebody to have five years of experience. And this is something that women have been in, in studies, have, it has been shown that women will not really apply for a job if they don't have that five years of experience, whereas men are perhaps more likely to apply for a position even if they don't have all of the requirements. So that's something we need to change. We need to help companies reach out to that potential talent of women without uh, maybe creating these requirements that are almost like gatekeeping them out. But on the other side, we need to make sure we tell those women the story of how a cybersecurity career can be an amazing life journey. We need to show them women in different jobs, in different phases of their lives, women who are mothers. That's why I bring my young baby with me uh, to hacker events in Israel. When we try to reach out to women in the Israeli community through the leading cyber ladies network, or through the Hackeriot initiative, which is also graciously hosted by Tel Aviv University. We want to reach out to women in those ages where they make decisions about their career and their lives. And we want to show them how incredibly vibrant, innovative, interesting, um, you know, full of possibilities a career in cybersecurity is. Otherwise, the stories that they will hear are only the negative stories. They will only hear about the women who burnt out or dropped out. They would only hear about the women who couldn't get in because uh, they found a, a company filled with men that had a DNA and a culture that they just didn't see themselves fit in. We really need to put these stories out there. And that's a big part of what I try to do with the Leading Cyber Ladies Network and again with the Hackeriot Initiative. It's an incredible hackathon. Uh, please do check out hackeriot.org. It's all about bringing younger women or women that are choosing their career closer to that next job in cybersecurity. So that's how I feel about that. And I feel that there are solutions at play on both sides. What's really important and what I'm thankful, thankful for is that people like you many and many others are now understanding that it's not a women's problem. It's not a women's issue. It's an ecosystem issue and it's a workforce issue. We need all the help we can get in this industry. 
And we can't afford to miss out on 51% of that workforce, especially not because of biases and stories that are no longer relevant for, for the 21st century. So there are a lot of good things happening on that front. And I'm, I'm yeah. proud to be a part of that. And I think we can be hopeful and optimistic. So let me tell you, uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing in, in, I think, pushing more and more women to go into tech and specifically into cybersecurity, the, the communities that you're having, um, those other things and other programs that you have. I think they help a lot. So thank you on that. And I also want to say that I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, and I faced the, the same problem when I tried to hire cyber expert. Right. Um, you think that you're giving equal opportunities because you're writing this job description and you're saying, OK, everybody can apply. I actually want to encourage women to apply. But if you don't know um, that women address the job description in a different way, they analyze the job description in a different way. What you actually do is that you create a situation where a lot of women will not apply for this job. Because and when you, they and you really, miss out of talent, yeah, you miss out, and mm -hmm. and you think that you're okay because you're writing in this he she, uh, you're not using a gender in most places, but you don't know that there are specific sensitivities that you have to take into consideration when you really want women to feel comfortable to apply. So definitely be minded uh, for that. Make sure you read about it. Make sure you learn how to write job descriptions that will make both all genders feel comfortable. Uh, applying to, if you really want to hire women, if you really want to push this very important um, goal forward, just spend some time reading about how to write job description, effective job description that will also bring women to the job. So what I want to do now, I want to go to the rapid question session. I'm going to ask you a few questions, uh, a bunch of questions, uh, answer as quickly as you can. And then I will ask you uh, the last question of today. After we will finish with that, I will ask you the last question of today and we will wrap up this uh, podcast episode with that. Okay, okay I'm ready. Fire. Ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, here we go. PC or Mac? PC. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Chrome, Edge, Firefox, or Internet Explorer? I use all of them for different things. I don't use Internet Explorer anymore. Okay, that was a joke, obviously. <laughs> uh, Star Wars and st or Star Trek? Wow, Star Wars. Okay. Uh, swimming pool or the beach? The beach. Uh, the Simpsons, Family Guy, or Rick and Morty? The Simpsons. Okay, interesting. Classic. Microsoft yeah, classic, obviously. Uh, though you can see my answer. Yeah, obviously. Uh, I like Futurama. You should add Futurama. Uh, Futurama. To that you know, I never, I was never able to connect to this. Even though I love The Simpsons, I was never, was never able to connect to Futurama. You're lost. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I might give it another chance. Microsoft Word or Google Doc? Wow, uh, Google Doc nowadays. Microsoft yeah. Excel or Google Spreadsheet? Excel. Yeah. <laughs> I like being in the hybrid of things, you know, using the best of all worlds. You're using the best tool for every task that you have. Yeah. Okay. Jokes or riddles? Jokes. Okay. DC or Marvel? Wow, that's a difficult one. I have to say Marvel because my favorite character is Deadpool. Uh, okay. And he kind of got absorbed into the Marvel universe because of X-Men. So he's part yeah. of the X-Men world. So I would say Marvel as well. The only thing that would make me say DC is Gal Gadot, obviously. You know, uh, Batman and Wonder Woman. <laughs> they are they are two of the best characters in comics. And I have I have Batman and Wonder Woman comics, but I have more Deadpool comics. So I guess yeah, I agree. The character is great, but Gal Gadot for itself, the the woman, the 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 lady behind the character, uh, I'm in love with her. Okay. She made us all uh, proud. <laughs> yeah, uh, favorite book. Wow, The Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson. Oh, interesting. Okay. Favorite place in the world? London. <laughs> London. Favorite after song? After Tel Aviv. After Tel Aviv, after Tel Aviv obviously. Yes. obviously. <laughs> Favorite song? Ah, uh, that's a difficult one. I have so it many is. that I really like. Uh, I like Sure Shot by the Beastie Boys. Oh, it's a great song. Favorite movie? Um, Hackers, 1995. Hackers. Hackers. Yeah. Classic. Tea or coffee? Tea. Google Home or Alexa? None. I'm not letting those assistants into my home. No <laughs> I way. I have Google Home and I, I use it all the time. No um, way. <laughs> cats or dogs? Dogs. Okay, three more. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? 
Breakfast all day long. Um, okay, I ask you. I'll ask you this one, but you already answered it. I think your favorite comics character, Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah, I remember <laughs> when the first movie went out, and you went to the theater. I think wearing the costume. Of if course. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I I dressed up as Deadpool. And yeah, the, I, the I regenerating say... degenerate. What's not to love? It's just a perfect character, and he breaks the fourth wall, which really makes yeah. him incredible. The, the fourth wall inside the fourth wall, right? He has a snow yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the exactly. 16th wall. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I must say, I didn't know him very well before this movie. I didn't know why you are so excited. But after watching this movie, I it's thought obvious, to myself, right? she was right. Yeah, she was yeah. absolutely right. And, and uh, you know, it's most notable characteristic of Deadpool is that he can't shut up. Yeah. So <laughs> I really relate <laughs> with that. Yeah. <laughs> and the color okay. red, of course. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, beer, wine, or whiskey? Beer. Okay. So my last question for today: If you have one tip to give uh, to the cyber uh, people of the world, the people who listen to us right now, one thing to tell them, one message to one message to convey, what would it be? Don't panic, and adapt to what's happening. Yeah, don't panic. I think I know. From which movie this uh, recommendation comes from? The Hitchhiker's, from the Hitchhiker's Guide. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, of course. Uh, my first company was named 42 uh, from this book as well. Okay, guys, it was such a pleasure having you, Karen, in this podcast. I hope this is just the first time out of many. I hope to see you next time uh, to, on the stage of the Cyber Week uh, at the Tel Aviv University and to meet you and do a lot of things together in the future as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Manny. Stay safe, everybody. Sayonara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll see you next episode of Guardians of the Cyberspace. Thank you so much.